meeting, I'll call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Arvada Housing Authority for July 20th, 2020. Uh, Kristen uh, Rush, will you do the uh, roll call? Here. Chairman Williams. Vice Chairman Miller. Here. Commissioner Pfeiffer. Here. Commissioner Ford. Here. Commissioner Marriott. Here. Commissioner Simpson. Here. Com Commissioner Jones. Entertain a motion to excuse Mr. Jones. So moved. Everybody will vote on that. Mr. Jones is out of town, previously announced to us. That passes six to zero. Mr. Jones is excused. Next, we have the uh, minutes of the regular meeting of December 16, 2019. Boy, that's been a long time ago. Anybody have any changes or corrections to those minutes? If not, they stand approved as presented. Is there anybody that wishes to speak during public comment on the Arvada Housing Authority? Seeing none, I'll close the uh, public comment. Mr. Devin, if you'll, do you have any report um, of secretary or committees or unfinished business that you wish to report on? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, we do not have any reports of the Arvada Housing Authority under unfinished business. Very good. Uh, we do have some new business, and the first, and this is an important one, this is a changing of the guard. Uh, we are appointing Carrie Espinoza as Secretary of the Arvada Housing Authority. So, Ms. Espinoza, how are you tonight? You're muted. There you go, I think. Okay, our technical folks, if you'll get Ms. Espinoza up. You know, Ms. Espinoza, I always liked it when we couldn't hear your predecessor, but we really do want to be able to. Carrie, do you want to hang up and dial back in and see if that changes anything? And of course, council is hoping in a couple of weeks when I'm calling in remotely that uh, they'll still have the same silence feature, so. I bet this worked a few minutes ago, didn't it? Okay, now try unmuting. Are you there? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? We can. Modern okay, technology. Good. Sorry about that. Not, not your fault. Okay, the first item of business under new business is to consider a, a motion to appoint uh, Carrie Espinoza as the secretary of the Arvada Housing Authority. Do I have a motion to that effect? Ms. Ford. I'd like to make a motion to appoint Carrie Espinoza as the new, um, we probably have this on written, right? <laughs> Where is it? Sorry, Carrie. Let me get the good wording here. 
Executive Director? Is Secretary. As Secretary. So um, I'd like to uh, appoint Carrie Espinosa as Secretary of the Arvada Housing Authority. Okay, all votes are cast. That passes six to zero with Commissioner um, David Jones being an excused absence. Okay, Ms. Espinoza, it's your show to run at this point. Okay, so the next item of business is the annual report. Um, so included in your packet is a copy of the July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020 annual report for the Arvada Housing Authority. Um, I'm very pleased to present you uh, with this report reflecting our activities and accomplishments for the past year. First, I just wanted to highlight the new look of the report itself. Mm -hmm. We wanted to continue to provide the same high quality information as found in the prior report, but deliver in an updated format that's easily digestible to anybody who wants to learn more about the work of the Housing Authority. I do need to acknowledge the hard work of Adele Burton, who is our special events coordinator for creating this amazing report for us. Moving into the report itself, I wanted to pr provide a brief overview um, of highlighting, first of all, who we serve for the past year, we served an average of 457 households um, in Arvada. The average household income was $15,703. 53% of our participants are persons with disabilities. 40% are elderly. 8% were homeless before entering our voucher program. The Housing Authority paid just over $4.6 million in rental assistance to landlords. Um, we ended 2019 with just over $2,000 um, left in our budget. So we work hard to stretch every dollar that we receive to serve as many families as we can. And we're very proud of that. And as of June 30th, we still have 167 families remaining on the waiting list. Um, moving on to our partnerships, we continue to partner with um, Beyond Home and with the Community Table to operate self-sufficiency programs here in Arvada. We could not be as successful as we are without our partners, and so we, we appreciate their partnership and their willingness to work with us to improve the lives of the families in our program. We continued our work addressing homelessness. And in 2019, the Housing Authority was awarded 39 mainstream vouchers to this non-elderly disabled households who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. As of today, 20 of the 39 vouchers are filled. The city hired Don Lefke to serve as the city's homeless navigator. The Housing Authority and Don are partnering to offer housing opportunities to individuals and families that have been without stable housing for a significant period of time. And we're very excited about our, our efforts um, to house, house the homeless. Um, this is not in the report, but I really wanted to mention our, the Housing Authority's response to COVID-19. Um, as you can imagine, COVID-19 presented significant challenges for the Housing Authority team and our customers. Uh, we are a very customer service oriented team and our services involve a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with our customers. Uh, when we learned that the city building was closing temporarily, the team raced to create a plan to ensure that we were able to continue to deliver our, all of our services. And I'm very happy to report that we were successful in doing so. I'm so proud of this housing team and I'm inspired by their ability to really think outside the box to continue to deliver our superior levels of service. Looking into next year, um, we will continue efficient operation of the voucher program. We will continue to work with private developers and nonprofit organizations to encourage and support the construction or rehabilitation of affordable housing. 
We will continue to partner with nonprofits to support self-sufficiency, and we will continue to make advancements in our work to address homelessness in Arvada and throughout Jefferson County. Are there any questions about the report? Uh, Ms. Miller, you're first. Thank you. Ms. Espinoza, congratulations on your new appointment as secretary. Um, I, I should be looking up here, but you're on my screen, so I feel like I'm talking to you face-to-face. -face. If I look down here, I apologize. It's quite confusing. So um, seriously, great job on maintaining our service levels through this pandemic. You guys are amazing. You're incredible. I'm so proud of you and your team for all you've accomplished. I love the new look of the report. It's fantastic. Great job. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Ms. Ford. Uh, yes, I do too. I love the, the new look of that report. I noticed it immediately. It was great. Um, I do want to ask you one question. On, um, <clears throat> on those with disabilities, um, wh what percentage of those with disabilities would you say are unable to work that, of the clients that you have? Around, just a rough estimate. Uh um, yeah, that's, I would say out of the 53%, um, probably 80%, that's a, that's a guess. Um, we're not able to really ask our families if they, if they have the ability to work. Um, we, if they are interested in working, we do strive to, um, help them achieve that goal. But uh, um, it's not a question that we particularly ask. So and, it, it is a guess. And I, and I was asking it, uh, thinking about the number of people with disabilities who are able to work and can't find jobs. So I was curious um, if that was a large percentage of your uh, clientele or if, if your clientele were really folks who just had severe disabilities and were unable to work? Yeah, I would say that the majority of our folks are not able to work out of that 53%. Okay, and then looking at the average annual income of the families, it's it's kind of a sad number, 15,000. I'm assuming that's either, I don't know, what kind of jobs would would service, right? That's about what city council yeah. gets paid. Well, a little and, and more. <laughs> a little more. Um, we do serve a 40% um, of our participants are elderly, so they are on a limited income, which I think contributes to the low average household income. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ms. Simpson. Sure. Uh, thank you. So I just wanted to echo these sentiments of my colleagues and say how much we appreciate all the work that you and your team do. Um, the report looks fantastic and the work that you guys do is so important, particularly in light of the uh, the crisis that's uh, facing us now and surely to grow. So um, thank you guys. Um, I see 167 families remaining on the waiting list. Um, uh, so I know there are all kinds of options. I just wanted to express my um, enthusiasm for uh, some of these projects we see in the um, upcoming uh, developments and uh, for various uh, options from seniors to Habitat for Humanity, et cetera. So I just wanted to say thank you guys for the good work and keep it up because we need you. Thank you, Commissioner. Very good. The next item on the agenda is Habitat for Humanity contract amendment. Mr. Marriott. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. So this next item coming up is a renewal of a contract with uh, Habitat for Humanity for a piece of property that the Housing Authority owns at roughly 52nd and Carr Street. I own two adjoining properties to that uh, property, and the development of that property will certainly uh, have some uh, impacts, and there will need to be some negotiations and whatnot done between myself and whoever develops that property. As such, I would ask my fellow 
uh, Housing Authority Commissioners here to recuse me from uh, any discussions or actions on this item and particularly I would prefer to leave the room for this item and then uh, I'll be happy to come back when we'll you have, have the sergeant of arms uh, escort you out and bring you back in <laughs> do I have a motion Ms. Miller so moved if you will vote all right That uh, motion to recuse Mr. Marriott passes uh, five to zero. Mr. Marriott not voting, Mr. David Jones being an excused absence. Okay, Ms. Espinoza, you want to advise us on this item? Sure. So, in 2019, the city of Arvada, the housing authority conveyed a parcel of land located at 52nd place in Car Street to Habitat for Humanity for the development of affordable housing. Due to COVID-19, there have been delays for Habitat for Humanity to get the approvals needed to begin development. This motion for contract amendment will extend the governmental approvals period to January 1st of 2021, which will allow additional time for Habitat for humanity to go through the developmental review process. Um, it would also give, um, it would also extend the closing to June 30th of 2021. And it's your recommendation that we uh, adopt this contract amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is. Very good. I would entertain a motion or any questions. Ms. Ford, you're first. I'll make a motion if you may no one proceed. has questions. Do you have any questions? Left? No. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion uh, for an extension of the contract with Habitat for Humanity. Motions to approve. All votes are cast. That passes five to zero. Mr. Marriott. Um, abstaining and, and recusing, and Mr. Jones being an excused absence. Okay, Sergeant of Arms, if you'll bring back Mr. Marriott. <laughs> there, there really isn't, no. It's, it's on the... Mr. Mayor, can I, Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question? Of yes. The team? This format's a little bit different. I don't see motions and other things. Is there a change to the format? Uh, look in these, maybe? I don't believe there's been a change to the format, but we can add motions um, in or the future. We, or we can make up the motions as we go. To I think that's well, traditionally what we've done is just sort of made up the motions. Okay, I just remember there should be information and some other details that like that's statements. on our i mean we certainly have that on our council reports but we can add that to this if you'd like us to oh it's just yeah sure okay next we have um, the housing choice voucher program administrative plan revisions Ms. espinoza so the housing team is proposing revisions to the administrative plan regarding the section 8 housing choice voucher program Due to the um, mainstream vouchers that we were awarded in late 2019, we are required to create policies that govern the mainstream program. Um, and in addition, we made recommendations to, to make a few um, additional edits to the administrative plan, which are outlined in the proposed change document. Um, so we are, I'm making a recommendation for the board to approve the proposed changes. Okay, any questions from council or action? Mr. Fiverr. So I can make up the motion on this, huh? Yeah, let's see if you can wing it. So moved. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I move to approve the proposed uh, revisions to the administrative plan. That works. As presented by staff or team. Sorry, uh, John, I've got you blocked out. Now you're back in. Okay, all votes are cast. That passes six to zero. Mr. Jones being an excused absence. 
Uh, Ms. Espinosa, is there any further business to come before the Housing Authority? No, nothing additional. Very good. Again, uh, on behalf of all of Council, congratulations on your uh, appointment as Secretary. Uh, your department is indeed doing an excellent, excellent job. Congratulations from all of us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. It's good to see everyone. So I will adjourn the uh, Housing Authority uh, meeting of July 20th, and at this time, call to order the Arvada City Council meeting uh, for July 20th, 2020. Call upon Council Member Lauren Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. First, if you would please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Now, if you would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kristen Rush, if you'll do the roll call. Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Miller. Here. Council Member Pfeiffer. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Council Member Jones. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Simpson. Here. Mr. Pfeiffer. I move to excuse uh, Council Member Jones from tonight's business meeting. All votes are cast. That passes six to zero. Mr. Jones, who had previously advised us that he would not be able to participate remotely tonight. Um, is hereby excused. Next, we have the minutes of July 6, 2020. Any changes or corrections? Seeing none, the minutes of the July 6, 2020 City Council meeting shall stand approved. Next, I'll call upon Council Member John Marriott for a special recognition that we're doing tonight. Thank you, Your Honor. Today, I have the great honor in getting to uh, present a recognition to Lillian Halligan for her 100th birthday. Um, Lillian will be celebrating her 100th birthday on July 24th and there's going to be a drive-by parade uh, for her achieving this milestone, but it got me thinking about the milestones that Lillian has seen in her lifetime. And uh, I jotted down a quick list and it's quite an impressive list. Lillian was born in the Roaring Twenties. We've all heard of the Roaring Twenties, one of the best times uh, economically for this country. Followed in the 1930s by the Great Depression, and I'm betting Lillian uh, remembers that and probably has, uh, has some uh, memories both ways of the Depression. In the 1940s, Lillian was witness to World War II, again, one of the uh, more impactful parts of our history. In the 1950s, though, Lillian got to witness not only air travel becoming common, but Elvis. Of all things, <laughs> she got to see Elvis when he was new. Um, in the 1960s, Lillian was witness to men walking on the moon. Who would have thought in the 1930s that by the 1960s, man would be on the moon? The 1970s, things definitely took a darker turn, however, when Lillian got to witness disco. We all <laughs> would like to forget about that, I think. The 1980s brought the fall of communism along with the Cold War, and the 1990s brought the age of computers, something we all use now today, and in fact, I think I have to use a computer to make toast at home. In the 2000s, Lillian has seen the, the age of cell phones, where we all communicate so quickly and easily now. And of course, in the, in the 2010s, not only did she witness man on the moon, but has witnessed space probes landing on Mars. Who would have thought that in the 1920s that you would witness all these things? And I think for all of us, Lillian is a great reminder that for all of us, we need to appreciate all the things we've seen in our lives and all the things to come. And Lillian, uh, for you as well, I, after seeing this list of things that you've seen, I'm sure you're as excited as I am about the things to come. So with that, I would like to read this proclamation, and it says, Whereas longevity of life is a blessing for an individual and for a community which benefits 
from the knowledge, creativity, and experiences this individual brings to all. And whereas the city of Arvada recognizes with respect and admiration the contribution of senior citizens to our community, and whereas Lillian Halligan loves Colorado and has lived here for 53 years, spending over 34 of those years as a proud resident of Arvada, and whereas Lillian Halligan, at 100 years of age, has lived during the most eventful century of this nation's history and has been a model and inspiration to her family and to those that have known her. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the mayor and city council of the city of Arvada, Colorado, that July 24, 2020, be proclaimed as Lillian E. Halligan Day in the city. And we offer sincere congratulations and best wishes for Lillian for many, many more years of happy days in the future to share with her family and friends. And it's dated this 20th day of July, 2020, and uh, signed by the mayor and all members of council. And I will uh, bring this down to you. And uh, if you'd like, you may uh, say a few words for us. <laughs> oh, yes, you did. Well, how wonderful. Congratulations. And I know that there will be some people uh, for your parade on the, on the 24th. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Right. And you don't have to stick around tonight. You can certainly leave at w whenever you would like. So. You bet. Next we have uh, uh, public comment. We have no other presentations tonight, so public comment. And we have uh, Kurt um, Sela. You bet. How y'all doing tonight? Doing good. Good. I, I was wondering if you guys, and Jones is out, so I'm sure you guys probably don't know anything about it. Are you guys up to speed with the resurfacing project that was done in Ralston Valley 4 last year? Oh, the roads? About some of the, yes. Where are we at with that? Well, what we can do is we can have staff um, get you a report. Any particular roads in particular that you're... Yeah, every road in Ralston Valley 4 except for the main drive through 74, Divinity and 72nd. I mean, every side street in there is a mess. It's been a wreck. We've been talking about it for over eight months and nobody... It's You send a, uh, 
street sweeper through once in a while, but that's not curing the problem with it jacking up our concrete and destroying our vehicles. So, so what's uh, the specific problem that you're experiencing? So, so I talked with Mr. Herrig back in January about the whole thing, and when they put the surface down, when they resurfaced the side streets, they, they actually retarded the main drive. When they resurfaced the side streets, they just put an oil base down and put gravel down. That gravel has not stuck since they put it down. And it's not only going in the storm drains. I've got hardwood floors in my house. We don't even wear shoes in the house. And I find them in the middle of the hardwood floor. They're tearing up and etching all the... I've got $30,000 in concrete I've put around my house. And it's destroying all of it from being on the tires. I got, I've got uh, pictures of the driveway with tar marks all over it. The tar ends up in our house. I've, talk, I've reached out to Herrig. Talked to him. I guess he's not part of it anymore. I've left Jones, I don't know how many phone calls, and I have never heard back from him. The, um, there's um, talk about it on the next door page. I mean, it's just, I'm just kind of wondering where we're at with it and what we need to do to get it taken care of. Yeah, I, I assume that's the chip and seal program. It is. It, it, no, that's so, exactly so what Mr. it is. Devin. Yes, it probably is. Excuse me. Yes, it probably is, but we'll have to consult with our uh, public works team and get back to this job. Okay, we have your information. We will certainly get back to you. Because we were even told that the contractor admitted that they put it down wrong, you know, and here we're going on a year just be nice to know where we're at and it like you know if i wanted to live on a gravel road i would have moved out to eastern weld county or something so okay, sir we'll, right we'll get back to you have a good day you too anybody else wish to address city council during public comment portion seeing none i'll close the public comment portion we have um, a few items on the consent agenda the first is a resolution authorizing the issuance of a purchase order in the amount of approximately two hundred six thousand dollars to Transwest Trucks Trailer RV for the purchase of a water brake van. Uh, the second one is a resolution authorizing an agreement between Arvada and RN Civil Construction for the Ralston Water Treatment Plant Zone 5 Pump Station Replacement Project in an amount not to exceed approximately two and a half uh, million dollars. Next one is a resolution authorizing an amendment to an existing construction contract buying between Arvada and PCL Construction in the amount of uh, 3200000 plus for the Ralston Raw Water Pump Station and Pipeline Project. And the final is, uh, consent agenda item is a resolution authorizing an agreement between Arvada and uh, Uterich, uh Engineers for engineering services for intersection improvements in an amount not to exceed approximately $228,000 in the first year. Mr. Marriott. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that uh, items R20-058 through 20-061 all be approved. Motions for approval of the consent agenda. That passes 6 to 0 with Mr. Jones being an excused absence. Next, we have two resolutions. The first is R20062, a resolution authorizing an intergovernmental agreement by and between the City of Arvada and the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District, DBA Mile High Flood District, regarding final design, right-of-way acquisition, and construction of drainage and flood control improvements for Ralston Creek at Croke Canal. Mr. Devin? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, this uh, IGA will address uh, some uh, flood control issues that we've had in that partic this particular reach of Ralston Creek. Um, and uh, this was one of the locations in 2013 that we had some problems during the 2013 floods. Uh, so this project, which is a collaborative project uh, with uh, Mile High uh, Flood Control District, will address those problems and um, allow us to uh, uh, improve our flood control in the entire community. Uh, so we're recommending approval of the resolution. Very good. Mr. Marriott? Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment, and if there's no other questions or comments, I'll uh, make a motion. There are no so, other Okay, so let me, lights. let me make a motion first, and then I will make a comment. Uh, so I'm going to move that resolution R20-059 between the city of Arvada, or excuse me, 20-062 between the city of Arvada and uh, Urban Drainage and Flood Control District be approved. And what I will note here is that um, these are really good deals for Arvada. The, uh, Arvada is paying for half the cost and the urban drainage and flood control different district, now called Mile High Flood District, I believe is their new name, uh, is paying for the other half. And, and their funding comes through a uh, property tax increment that all of us within the district pay. Um, but it's, it's done that way because floodwaters 
don't respect borders. Um, if they start somewhere, they, they all go downstream. And so we all have a, a, a stake in uh, these flood control projects, whether you're at the site or if you're downstream of the site. And so I think this is just a great example of some of the best of cooperation between government in our region. One of the ways that Colorado is very unique and one of the ways that Colorado does much better, and particularly the Denver Front Range area does much better than other locations around the country because we can and do cooperate on these kinds of things to all of our benefit. So with all that, I certainly will be voting yes. Okay, motions for authorization. All votes are cast. That passes six to zero. Mr. Jones being an excused absence. Thank you. Next we have resolution 20-063, a resolution authorizing a sixth extension of the effective date of the city manager's declaration of emergency related to the no novel coronavirus COVID-19 and the associated public health crisis. Uh, Ms. Morris, are you taking this? I am, Your Honor. Following the review of the current public health crisis, the city manager is requesting council approval to extend the emergency declaration from its current expiration date of July 31st, 2020 through September 30, 2020. This request would extend the emergency declaration mirroring similar action taking taken by neighboring municipalities. In our previous update to council, we noted that the rate of additional cases was actually decreasing for a period of time. Unfortunately, over the past two weeks, our region has seen an increase in COVID-19 positive cases, and of particular interest are the two-week cumulative incident rate figures for Jefferson County. The most recent information demonstrates the ever-changing conditions associated with the public health crisis, which requires an environment that will allow for quick decisions in order to focus on the safety and well-being of community and city team members, delivery of course services, management of city resources, and general uncertainty associated with the recovery of Arvada businesses and institutions. It's for this reason the city manager has requested an extension of the emer emergency declaration through September 30, 2020. The city manager has and will continue to record any use of the powers authorized under the city code. City council will be regularly informed of all such action as soon as practical under the circumstances. The Arvada team recommends that the city council approve R20-063, a resolution authorizing a sixth extension of the effective date of the city manager's declaration of emergency related to the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, and the associated public health crisis. Okay, I'll open it up for council questions or action. Ms. Ford, you're first. I'll make a motion if there are no questions. You may proceed. I move that R20-063, a resolution authorizing a sixth extension of the effective date of the city manager's declaration of emergency relating to the novel coronavirus and the associated public health crisis be approved. Motions for approval. I'm going to speak to this motion. I think um, anticipating that this is approved, that there really is a sense that Mr. Devin has done an excellent job of keeping us apprised. Of, of his decisions. Um, you do have to be very nimble during these times, uh, but even with having to make immediate decisions from time to time, uh, we've always received good background information and justification for his actions, so I'm comfortable supporting this. Mr. Piper, you'll vote. Did I convince you? Pass it six to zero. <laughs> but, <laughs> That passes six to zero with Mr. Jones being an excused absence. Ms. Miller, do you want to lead us through? Uh, the, with all uh, of my heart and soul, Your Honor. Reading? With all of my heart and soul. I move that Council Bill 20-018, an ordinance authorizing the second amendment to the 2020 operating and capital budget in the amount of $1.5 million and authorizing an intergovernmental agreement by and between the state of Colorado acting by and through the Department of Transportation and the City of Arvada pertaining to the Alkire Street side path, 78th Ave to 80th Ave, to complete the trail and sidewalk network on the west side of Alkire Street between West 72nd Avenue and West 80th Avenue, CDOT Project Number 23662, and Council Bill 20-019, an ordinance repealing and reenacting Section 58-72, presiding judge, and repealing Section 58-72.5, clerk of the court, of Article 3, municipal judges, of Chapter 58, municipal court, of the City of Arvada Code, and Council Bill 20-020, an ordinance amending Chapter 98, taxation. 
by amending subsection 98-661E and section 98-243, amending chapter 11 of the Land Development Code, measurements, rules of construction, and definitions by amending section 11-3-3, definitions, and adding a new subsection 3-1-5-3 to the Land Development Code, chapter 3, use regulations of the City of Arvada Code to allow for the licensing and taxation of short-term rental of a dwelling, dwelling unit, or accessory, accessory dwelling, dwelling unit, residential, all be approved on first reading and ordered published and in full and public hearing be set for August 3rd, 2020 at 6.15 p.m. I just hope that the actual hearings are as exciting as your reading on first reading. All votes are cast. That passes on first reading. Very good. We have uh, next come to the time for our public hearing. So I will open the public hearing on the conditional use permit for Allison Village located at 5352 Allison Street. Mr. Devon. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I believe we have Ron Smetana virtually uh, uh, attending tonight's meeting and he'll be presenting the beginning comments for this report, this action. Rob, you need better lighting. You're always a little bit dark when we when we see you on this. All right, uh, I'll, uh, I'll work on that here in my office. Uh, maybe open the blinds a little more. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, the applicant in this instance is requesting conditional use approval to allow for the redevelopment of, proper, of the property into a 100 unit multifamily uh, affordable housing project located in an MXU mixed use urban uh, zoning district. The site at 5352 and 5354 Allison Street is currently occupied by two existing multifamily buildings containing 37 units. The property is approximately 1.9 acres in size. A single access point from Allison Street is proposed with a fire lane incorporated into the landscape area along the southern portion of the property per fire department requirements. A concept plan for the project was submitted with the conditional use request. The proposed building would have uh, three and four story elements uh, the proposed building would have be around 42 feet in height. Uh, with, uh, approximately 30% of the site is proposed to be landscaped, including a small urban park, which is a requirement of the MXU zoning. And 104 parking spaces have been indicated on the concept plan. A site plan application will be required uh, should the conditional use for the residential development at this location be approved. As part of that site plan, the proposed building, uh, I'm sorry, as part of that site plan, staff will review the specific details of the project against the land development code requirements. This includes a detailed review of the parking modifications requested, including the requirement that a parking study be provided and reviewed. Uh, we will also look at the building height and design and the landscape design. The Planning Commission recommended approval of the conditional use at their July 7th meeting on a vote of six to one. We have received signed posting log and mailing affidavit and they are in order. Uh, the applicant is in attendance for presentation and questions and I am also available for any questions you might have. Very good, the posting log and mailing affidavit will be made part of the record in addition to um, public comment we have received remotely uh, from uh, Mindy Moore and from the HOA board of 5360 townhomes. And we've all received those and they are made part of the record. Um, and I, is the applicant ready to make a presentation? Do we have the applicant remotely? Uh, Rob, do we have the applicant remotely? They're not here in the present in the council chambers. I am here. Okay. Ah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I can't do video, so I will just stick with um, audio. Hopefully you can hear me. For some reason, it's saying I'm not able to do video. Try again. Nope. Post has stopped it. Okay. Um, well, um, some of you already know um, quite a bit about Jefferson County Housing well, Authority. Well, hold, hold on, if you would. If you'll raise your right hand, 
since this is a public hearing. Okay, here we go. Now I've got video. There we go. Raise your right hand. Swear or affirm the testimony you'll give in these proceedings is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Very good. Now you may proceed. Okay. All right. Um, just a couple of things about uh, Foothills Regional Housing. We used to be Jefferson County Housing Authority. I want to take a minute and just say thank you for giving us a chance to present this um, amazing community that we're working on. Um, it really does fall into our mission, which I have put you you see on the screen and you also probably have in your packet. I won't read it out loud to you. You guys um, can you know read it on your own, but it this pro this property and this community we feel fits in directly with our mission. Um, next slide. Um, our our team, which you also have this slide, um, Aaron Cloakey is our developer. He's on the call today. He will be presenting. We also have Brett from our architect who will also be presenting. And then you guys know Susan Powers and um, her staff person, Shannon, who are our partners in this development. They are our um, developer partner. Okay, next slide. Again, our mission, sorry, I got ahead of myself on the mission. Next one. Okay, a couple of things about our portfolio. We have 21 properties consisting of 1,261 affordable units. We serve all of Jefferson County, so all it's about 760 square miles, and our properties are located all over Jefferson County. We have about 1,700, that number is almost 1,800 now, housing choice vouchers for use in all of Jefferson County, including the city of Arvada. Um, some of those vouchers we've just received in the last couple of months and then some other newer, um, some other ones at the end of the year, but 24 foster youth vouchers are also included in that number. Uh, we are serving youth transitioning out of foster care who are homeless with those vouchers. We have about 145 of the non-elderly disabled vouchers that uh, serve homeless non-elderly families uh, in Jefferson County. Some of those are pretty new. We did get a, a nice bump from HUD on those during COVID to help us get some folks off the street and reduce their exposure. So we've been working really hard to get them off the street. We have a housing rehab program that serves um, a lot of Jefferson County. We have 50 um, vouchers for homeless veterans. That number is about to increase. We've been working with the VA Medical Center to place approximately nine to 10 vouchers at this new development for our homeless veterans. So we'll be able to serve them um, in a nice new apartment very well deserved. Um, next slide. Just a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Uh, Jefferson County's uh, vacancy rate is about 5.6%. I think that's a pretty healthy vacancy rate, but the problem is the approximate hourly needed to afford the average rent, which our average rent is about 1500. You need to earn about $29 an hour to afford to live in Jefferson County. Next slide. And then I've broken it down a little further in Arvada at a 4.2 vacancy rate, that's a little low. They usually say about a 5% is a healthy market. So your, your vacancy rate is, is pretty tight. And then the um, average hourly needed to afford uh, property in Arvada, just a modest two bedroom is the $29.17 or $60,000 a year. I think we know a lot of our friends and families and neighbors do not earn that much money. So. Um, that's what we're here for, is to help close that gap. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron on this slide and let Aaron go into the details of our property and of our new community. So Aaron, Aaron is our developer, by the way. Your Honor, members of council, thank you for having me. Okay, Aaron, if you'll raise your right hand. Swear or affirm the testimony you're going to give in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Very good. You may proceed. And give us your address, if you would. Oh, yes. Um, 7490 West 45th Avenue, Wheat Ridge, Colorado, 80033. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, I Mr. Smetana did a really great, great job of doing a, an overview of our project. Um, uh, like he said, there is uh, existing two buildings on the property. Uh, those buildings were built in 1980 
And so at this time, we're proposing uh, 100 units, demolition of those two buildings and building uh, 100 new uh, one and two bedroom units. Um, I wanna go over a little bit just about why we're really excited about this project and why we think this is a great project, uh, not only for our residents, but for uh, the city of Arvada. Um, you know, first of all, we're really excited about this site to have close proximity to Old Town um, and to be close to uh, the G-Line transit and I-70 and close to proximity to retail and jobs. Um, we really couldn't ask for a better site to build uh, brand new units for our residents. Uh, second, we think this is really good for uh, the neighborhood. We've worked really hard with our architects and uh, to make sure that the, the design has evolved to be respectful of the neighbors and be something that really fits into uh, this neighborhood and along Allison Village. Um, this uh, proposed design also have str has really strong public space amenities, landscaping, um, and creating some sidewalk connections in an area that, that really does need it. Um, and finally, we are really excited to um, we're beginning st early stages of, in talks of, with adjacent landowners um, to build a trail connection to connect the community, the neighborhood, and our residents to the surrounding um, Arvada and to transit and to retail uh, to the east. Uh, again, these talks are in early stages, but we're really excited about the idea of working with the city and those adjacent uh, landowners. Uh, finally, we believe this is really good for our community. Um, you already know that this project is going to contribute construction related jobs uh, in Arvada and Jefferson County. Um, but what you may not know is that uh, Foothills Regional Housing is also putting in four and a half million dollars of our own equity to offset the total costs of this project, uh, which is roughly just over thirty four million dollars. Um, and this project is also going to be receiving state tax credit allocations in the amount of $6 million. Uh, and that amount is presently valued at $4.2 million. Uh, $1.9 million worth of materials are going to be fabricated by our general contractor uh, at their shop in Jefferson County. And finally, you know, we, this is creating affordable housing and meeting the goals of Arvada's comprehensive plan related to housing diversity and infill development. And so for those reasons, we're really excited uh, to be proposing this project to you all. Um, next slide, please. So to give you an idea uh, of who's going to be living in Allison Village, um, I wanna kind of give you an idea of the range of uh, residents that uh, live in our communities and that are we're proposing to live uh, in this community. So the unit rents are going to be ranging from $562 to $1,200 for a one bedroom, and then $675 to just over $1,400 for a two bedroom. And keep in mind, we qualify tenants based on their income. So we're looking at household incomes anywhere from $21,000 for a 30% units, and then up to $70,000 uh, household incomes for our 70% units. And so when thinking about our residents, think about, you know, we're talking about our community school teachers, our parks and street maintenance workers, our line cooks uh, and retail workers, for example. You know, these are a lot of people who are on the front lines uh, you know, these days uh, in light of COVID. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Rosendahl real quick. Um, she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the unique residents that we plan to serve with Allison Village and the community partnerships that we plan to engage. Thank you, Erin. Um, so I wanted to just give you an idea of some of the partnerships we've built with regard to this, this um, community. We plan on serving about 30 units uh, or 30 youth transitioning out of foster care that will be in addition to the 24 that we already serve in our program now we have a unique partnership with casa of jefferson county and jefferson county department of human services 
we serve currently serve twenty four youth you'll see on the next slide an example of one of those youth we're serving that's just one among many but these are youth that have transitioned out of foster care really don't have anybody to fall back on and I think about when I was transitioning out of high school and out of my home and into independence if I failed or if something went wrong I had somebody to fall back on these youth don't they do not have that family tie that they can go back to if things aren't going well for them our goal is to really set these youth up for success and we have partnered with Department of Human Services CASA STRIDE will be providing medical services on site for our youth and our veterans I already spoke about the nine veterans that will be serving here STRIDE will be providing medical and pull up we'll be doing a drive up medical clinic as well if needed we also have Red Rocks Community College who will be providing scholarship services scholarships to our youth through it from a private donor that they have received some funds for also providing GED classes any kind of college prep that our kids need to get them ready to go to school will be provided by Red Rocks and we're really excited about that we want this to be a stepping stone for our youth come in you know live at our property and you know become the next physician's assistant or you know daycare director or whatever it is that they see themselves wanting to do you'll see in the next slide that one of our youth wants to be a nurse and she's working on that so again services you can see those we will have all manner of services available for our youth next slide please I won't read this all to you but this is one of our youth that we're serving now and just an example of why it's so important she's really close to independence and we're excited for her and then a little bit about our veterans our nine homeless veterans will be served by VA Medical Center it's a partnership with the VA they will be providing all services case management medical anything that our veterans need to be successful we already serve 50 of those so this will be an addition to the 50 that we're serving already we know that that partnership works we know that the VA Medical Center being actively involved in our homeless veterans lives works we've watched it happen so we're really excited because those homeless veterans that we're serving now are having a really hard time finding a one-bedroom unit finding a unit that fits within the HUD payment standards is really difficult and we'll be able to provide them with that without them you know having to take their voucher and go to another community which is what's happening for some of our folks that can't find a one-bedroom in our community next slide so now I'm going to turn it over to our architect who's going to go into the details of the community Brett thank you Laura your honor City Council if you'll raise your here tonight if you'll raise your right hand swear affirm the testimony you'll give in these proceedings will be the truth of the whole truth and nothing but the truth I do very good if you'll give us your address 1738 Wincoop Street suite 203 Denver Colorado 80202 very good you may proceed thank you uh, so these next few slides, um, which we're going to show, are kind of a high-level insight into our design process for the appropriateness of the residential use for the property. Um, as you can see in the vicinity, uh, our, our red rectangle here uh, bordered to the west on Allison Street. Um, the nearest intersection to the north is West 54th and nearest intersection to the south is west 52nd um, note the proximity uh, over to the northwest um, corner is the rtd transit center <clears throat> next slide please uh, so this slide is context uses uh, immediately adjacent to our site as you can see um, to the west of allison we're bordered by single family and within the super block uh, is predominantly multifamily. Um, to the east, we're um, ordered with um, 
an open space uh, detention, uh, stormwater detention for the adjacent properties. And then to the east of that is uh, retail. Next slide. I uh, just want to note here in this slide, our proximity to that transit center. So currently from our site from the west is approximately uh, 0.48 miles. So almost a half mile to the transit center and Old Town, just to the north of the transit center. Um, within our proposal, uh, we're in discussions with HARCS. Um, we've caught wind of a potential future uh, a pedestrian path um, uh, linkage to the uh, water tower um, uh, open space there. So all of these are within proximity to our pro uh, our development and shorten um, the walks or, or uh, pedestrian paths to transit and Old Town. Next slide. Um, so this slide is representing, so as Aaron had mentioned, we're, um, the plan is to demolish the existing buildings. Um, so we're working with a clean canvas here. And um, so working with um, uh, Foothills, they really pressed us to um, really look at and respect the neighboring context. And um, they have a really good reputation for being good neighbors. So what we've imposed upon before we start any type of design are some um, uh, parameters upon the site. We knew we need to have fire access to all sides of the building. So we've located that along the southern edge of the property. And then the other big contextual clue were, these, uh, were the three-story townhouses to the north of us. So we created a, approximately a 40-foot, um, what we're calling the townhouse buffer. And so what's left in the green essentially informs us about the, the form of the building. Um, next slide. So this is a, a more or less a rooftop view. And what I want to point out here is um, the adjacent um, uses and um, heights of the building. So we're being respectful to along Allison um, Street with story, matching the three story of the townhomes and um, the three story to the south. Um, note that the apartment complex to the south of us has a three story and a four story component. Um, the four story components set further uh, to the east end of the site as we're also proposing the four, our four-story uh, portion further into the site. Um, note also, though being this the roof form, that we're respecting that buffer. We've pulled the, um, our north elevation off of the property line um, by approximately that 40 feet. Uh, next slide. So this is our site plan. Um, few things to note here is that we're placing all of our parking underneath a uh, portion of the building, approximately uh, three quarters of it will be covered. <clears throat> and then the, only the rear portion of the site will have uh, uncovered parking. Uh, on that southern edge, uh, Aaron had mentioned um, the, and Rob had mentioned the fire lane. So what we're trying to conceive this fire lane is more of an active use for our residents. And if that um, uh, connector bike path ever comes into play, then this would also be a, a public um, connection. Um, we're trying to make this, like I said, as, as active as possible, um, making it green, pleasant, um, with um, variation of uh, colored concrete and, and uh, raising the overall aesthetics of that, um, of that fire lane. Um, next slide. I will pass it over to Robert who will talk about our parking. Good evening. I got up. 
truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Very good. Robert Palmer, Strategic Land Solutions, 2595 Ponderosa Road, Franktown, Colorado, 80116. Thank you. So you could, Brett, Brett was kind of leading into the parking conversation here. And on your screen, you can see several different uh, different facilities that have similar parking array, you know, parking numbers compared to what, what we're proposing on this site. And this type of housing with the access to public transportation that we have here and the access to downtown or like close amenities for shopping and restaurants and stuff, we just don't see the, the vehicle use that we, we would have seen in the past or with other type of, of market rate. In general, we're seeing a reduction in parking, you know, just something that's kind of something we see now that we didn't see five or even five or six years ago was we, we're seeing this parking maximum coming into play now where communities are saying, we're going to look at a minimum, but we don't want you to be over parked as well, because we're seeing with, with different ride sharing and public transportation and all the money that Colorado has put into public transportation, we're seeing a decline in vehicle ownership um, across the board and especially in this type of housing um, and serving a broad population like we're, we're talking about here. Um, Mr. Rosendahl talked about the 30 youth that we're going to house transitioning out of foster care. And according to Allison Pierce, who's with the, she's a social care worker with Jefferson County Department of Human Services. And she kind of, that's kind of her, her part in that organization is to help kids coming out of, out of foster care and that type of housing and transitioning into living on their, on their own. And so right now out of the 32 kids slash young adults that she works with, only 12 of them have vehicles. And so we're talking about bringing, you know, 30 of those into this property. So you would see this reduction of, of vehicles coming in. And even if it's not a full 30 that comes in there, 40%, only 40% of that part of market rate or for that part of this, the user of this facility would, would have vehicles. And then on here, we've got this atrium senior housing, which is parked at a 0.72 to one. And that's a predominantly senior facility, 55 and above. And so you just see at that end of it, even a really low, that 0.72 is actually higher than what we needed to park it or what was required by code. We had extra parking in there for um, Christmas parties and things like that. And we had uh, in that facility, we're gonna bring in uh, different people to help with senior care and things like that. So we had extra parking for them. So that, that site's actually even at a 0.72 to one was over parked. So as far as the parking on this site goes, we're, we're comfortable from a management position looking at the other properties that, that we've developed, other properties that the, the housing authority owns, um, that we feel comfortable with the parking ratio that we're, that we're proposing with the site. So if you want to go on to the next slide, I think unless there's any questions on parking right now. We'll let you finish your presentation. We'll uh, then look to see if we have any public testimony and then uh, we'll go into council questions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, so this next slide is putting the building into the context. Um, so you can see just in terms of form, size, height, um, street frontage, it blends in very well into the existing um, context. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, Allison Street uh, elevation. Um, we're doing our best to activate the sidewalk we'll be putting in a new sidewalk uh, that connects um, the north and southern uh, properties um, reconnecting it and really trying to activate that um, that street frontage uh, and then you can also kind of get a glimpse of the fire lane and in the animation of that and how it will activate that um, that southern facade and then the the grass paving um, also softening up that that uh the long uh, fire lane next slide uh this is uh just a quick shot of the um transition between the three-story and the four-story portions um we talked a little bit about the urban park requirements um so we have different amenities around the site um as i mentioned uh, on allison street we have some amenities uh, along, uh right in the front elevation and then we'll have a 
few other amenities here in the central portion, and then we have more amenities in the um, in the eastern part of the site. Um, next slide. Just want to hit highlights here. This building is going to be very um, energy efficient. Um, we're going after a zero energy ready home certification. Uh, that doesn't mean it's uh, net zero. It just means we're getting close to it and it's going to be a very efficient building. Um, that particular program is um, held pretty high standard in terms of the um, sustainability and energy conservation programs. Um, so what that kind of means is we'll be about 40 to 50 percent um, less, uh, more energy efficient than your typical apartments. Um, we will have en enhanced indoor air quality um, through our heating and cooling systems, um, through our um, fixtures that we specify, we'll be using 25% less water consumption than uh, your typical apartment. Um, and we'll be recycling two waste streams from our construction. Uh, next slide. So um, we've kind of hit up on the different uh, features of the conditional use criteria and illustrated them. Um, just a few things to highlight. We are consistent with the 2014 comprehensive plan. Uh, we are consistent with the new MXU zoning district. And um, as, you, as we illustrated, our use is very similar to uh, the context and uh, there are no adverse uh, impacts um, that we're imposing upon the natural environment to this uh, site. Next slide. Oh, that's it. All right. <laughs> so if I may, I would like to just add a couple of things um, to kind of wrap things up. Thank you again for giving us an opportunity to showcase this property. I will add that this property will be going in for a very competitive 4% state, 4% um, federal credit. Um, it'll, we'll, we'll be putting in the application August 1st. This, um, this project requires us to have about $18 million in private activity bonds to go with the 4% uh, financing. So far, we've accumulated almost all of that. We're about $2.6 million off. Um, we can thank Jefferson County for um, some of that private activity bond allocation. Also, the city of Arvada, we thank you for the six, it was about $6 million in private activity bond allocation. And something that we found to be very exciting was that the city of Golden was willing to give us their allocation as well, um, which was about 1 million, um, because they were really excited to support a property, a community like this in um, Jefferson County. We have applied to the city of Arvada for the next small amount that we need. I think that'll go a long way for us to be really competitive in this round. Um, these these properties, these communities are always, anytime you go in for low-income housing tax credits, it's really, really competitive. Um, but we're really excited about this one and, and think we have a really good shot at getting it in our first round. No promises, but we're excited about it. So that's all I have. Does that end your presentation? It does, thank you. Very good. Uh, Kristen Rush, do we have any member of the public that signed up to speak? Or I just see we have no one in council chambers wishing to speak. Okay, so we have uh, no comments from that perspective, um, and as such, no need for rebuttal. And therefore, I will close the public testimony portion, open it up for city council questions at this point. Mr. Marriott, you're first, then Mr. Pfeiffer, and this, then Ms. Simpson. Thank you, Your Honor. I have a question for uh, one of our team members um, to help us out maybe since this is the very first time we've done this where we've reviewed a conditional use permit under our new land development code. If they can, and maybe Ms. Morris, may, this may be you, to um, help refresh our minds on exactly what we are approving here. Are we approving of 
all of the details of this particular development or are we approving this particular use and all then the details become administrative via our new land development code? So that question I think is probably going to be answered by Rob Smetana or Emily Grog. I, we've got them both on Zoom tonight and so they should be able to walk you through the applicable criteria and the implications of approval tonight on this development in total. Okay, thank you. Rob, did you hear my question? I did, so I'll take the first stab and then uh, Emily can jump in if, uh, if I miss something. But uh, the intent of the conditional use permit, as we looked at the land development code uh, in the MX mixed use districts was to give council the opportunity to make sure they felt comfortable uh, having residential development take place at appropriate locations. I know there was uh, some concern that we might see residential proliferate and take over some of our commercial areas. So that is why uh, it became a conditional use in the MX districts. Um, and really the conditional use is just about the use. Uh, is the council comfortable with the use in a given location? Uh, if the council uh, approves such a use, then all of the details would be administratively reviewed with a site plan at that time uh, when they move on to the next step. Okay. Thank you. That answers the question for me. I appreciate that. Let me uh, ask you a question then about, Rob, if you want to stay up about, you know, one of the things about this particular proposal that catches my eye is the uh, very different parking ratio than I've seen us ever, uh, uh, ever approve. So I wonder if you can walk us through um, you know, what, what does our code call for and how would this administratively get to what they're asking for? So uh, as part of the, the code, we did have a parking reduction area in, old, in and around the Old Town area. Uh, so we uh, basically uh, had some uh, ability to reduce parking in the core of Old Town and then to a lesser extent, as it transitions south of uh, the tracks down to I-70 and then a piece uh, north of Old Town along Wadsworth Boulevard. And so this project is within uh, what we call Zone B, which allows for a reduction uh, based on proximity to transit, also um, transit demand management practices that might be put in place, uh, such as electrical vehicle charging, bike racks, um, ride share opportunities, shared bands, th those type of things. And again, those we would review when we're, when we're looking at this project at the site plan level. Uh, but that allowed for a 15% reduction. And then beyond that, there is the opportunity, uh, not necessarily permitted outright, but the opportunity to request an additional reduction based on uh, providing a parking study that we would review at the staff level and determine if uh, the particular use uh, has a lower parking requirement than um, even that 15% reduction for transit location in the Newtown area would allow. Um, but to also give an example, the project just to the south of this site, which is called Columbine Village, uh, that project is an independent uh, senior project and that has a parking ratio of 0.92. And that is one of the projects we looked at when we were developing the land development code and looking at the parking uh, requirements. And we did uh, reach out to our code enforcement at that time to ask if they had ever had any uh, complaints brought to them about parking on that site or overflow parking from that site. And they did not have any uh, complaints or any issues that they were aware of on that site. So that's just to kind of give you an example of the context where this particular property is located. Okay, so let me follow that up with a couple of questions then. If I'm not uh, mistaken, the uh, required parking ratio within that zone district is uh, 1.4 parking spaces per unit, is that correct? Rob, can you hear me? I'm not muted. 
Rob, did you hear that last question? Uh, no, it okay. looked like I saw the mute. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Let me let me re-ask that question. So, in in this zone district, in this MX zone district, is the parking required parking ratio uh, 1.4 spaces per unit? Is that what the code calls for? Uh, for affordable, there there are two regulations depending on the bedrooms. 1.4 for uh, studio and one bedrooms, and two for two or larger bedrooms. Okay, and so this is 100 units, something like 70 of them, 70-ish of them are one bedroom and 30-ish of them are two bedroom, is that correct? Something like that? Yes, that looks like it's 72 one bedroom and 28 two bedroom. Okay, and so how many how many parking spaces would that require if we were just going by what's in the what's in the code, do you know? It would be 157. 157. Okay. Um, but we can reduce that by 15% because it's win within the TOD area? That's or, correct. Or plus, plus any other uh, uh, things they might do to reduce the parking demand. Okay. Okay. Well, let's just talk, let's just talk about that 15% one at first. So that would be, you can reduce it by about 24, 25, somewhere in there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's going to be close. Okay. So that leaves us 130-ish spaces or something that's required. And then you you have the ability to administratively take then 20% off of that. Is that correct? Uh, cor uh, correct. Uh, if, if there is a, a good reason for that, and we would require a parking study to okay. determine that. Okay. Uh, to compare it to other uh, similarly positioned projects and uh, a review of those parking requirements at those projects. Right. Okay. And so that would um, that would yield somewhere around 100 parking spaces or a little bit more. Correct. Yeah. I mean, their their conceptual plan shows 104. 104. Okay. So that's how that's how they get to the number that that they're requesting. So. Tell me about um, about what kinds of things you might use to make that decision, that 20% decision, that last 20%. It's a parking study uh, that's based on what? Based on how they intend to use it or who's intended to live there? We would ask for similar projects in similarly positioned locations uh, with the very similar access to transit, uh, both in this instance, rail and bus as well as employment and have them review those projects, provide us the data for those projects in terms of the parking that was required and wherever that situation may be. Uh, uh, hopefully they can find some locations that are similar in, in Jefferson County. Um, and then we would review that information and determine if it would be appropriate to reduce the parking further okay. than the 15%. Okay. And so if they provide you with four other locations where the parking is same or less than this, how do you know if those parking situations are working or not? I mean, I can understand that somebody allowed them to be built, but I think we're more concerned with how it works, not whether somebody else allowed something to be built. We can ask them uh, as part of that to do a, a survey of parking needs at a location. I mean, you know, we can say at 7 p.m. tell us how many spaces are being utilized okay got it okay and then uh, you had mentioned the property immediately to the south has even less parking but it's a senior senior restricted and this will not be correct uh, correct although senior being it looks like I, I just looked it up to make to verify it looks like it's just 55 and older so and it's independent living right okay all right, so um, I want to move on to question to uh, to Ms. Rosendahl. Maybe might be the one to to uh, answer this question. And and um, just want to say, her and I have spoken about this project when it was in the conceptual stage. So we've spoken about it before. But the question I have for you is, I, I think one of the things you're uh, saying one of the reasons why reduction in parking might be warranted is that your plans for 30-ish um, of these units to be uh, children who are transitioning out of uh, foster care and wouldn't be driving at as great of a percentage as, as maybe other adults might be. 
Uh, so that being one of the justifications. The question I would have is whether it's these residents or other residents of this project, um, if they're not going to have a car, where are they going to get kind of the basics, the necessities of life, things like I think of groceries. Like where can you walk to to get groceries if you live here? So um, I will tell you that many of our families do not have vehicles, and they are very resourceful. They use the bus. They use the, the light rail, and they can get right over to the Target on Kipling, get the groceries that they need, or the Walmart up the way on Ralston and get back to their property no problem with groceries. Um, I, we've just not had anybody say to us, I can't get groceries because I don't have a car. Um, they they definitely manage and being this close to, to transit, they'll manage just like anybody else would manage who didn't have a car. They would jump on the light rail, get their groceries and come home. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, one other question, You're, you mentioned you're going to have a little commercial space component to this in the front um, that may be operated one way or another. If that proves over time to not be viable, is that space convertible to, to residential and would the rules that you're developing under allow you to do that, to convert that into f more residences or would it have to be something else? Well, it's pretty small um, and we don't plan on using it for any real commercial purpose. We don't plan on having any kind of coffee shop. We, you know, we had tested that theory out and decided that that just didn't work for us. In talking with Red Rocks Community College, um, it is our hope that they're going to operate a training program from that space um, for our, our youth and veterans that are going to be residing there. So it won't add any additional parking, but um, our hope is to do maybe a maintenance training uh, classroom there or a uh, multifamily training classroom. What we're finding is it's really hard to find maintenance guys. I think anybody who has um, rentals will tell you that it's really hard to find a good qualified maintenance person. So that's something we've been talking about doing, um, providing GED classes out of that space. So it will be a training space of some kind, but will not be rented out or used for any kind of commercial purpose. Okay, and won't be converted to residential at some point you down know, the road. I don't think we could. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to, to do some research on that, to be honest. Okay. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. That's all the questions I have. Very good. Mr. Pfeiffer and Ms. Simpson has indicated she'd like to reserve the motion. Okay, well, that's what I wanted, but she took it, so. Oh, you're good. Do you have any other questions, Mr. Pfeiffer? Okay. Ms. Simpson? Apologies, Mr. Pfeiffer. Um, so I actually only had one question before I would make the motion unless any of my other colleagues wish to speak. Yeah, Ms. Um, Ford's going to have a, a question or so. Perfect. So go ahead and ask your questions, then we'll move on to Ms. Ford. And you have reserved the motion. Yay. So uh, a quick question, um, going back to the um, sustainability measures in the uh, complex, I was excited to see these. Would you be able to share just roughly how much those are anticipated to um, uh, affect or reduce uh, bills for uh, residents of the community, for instance, their uh, water bill or their electric bill? So we pay all utilities at our properties, so, and especially at this property, we will be paying all utilities. Um, our tenants will not be responsible for utilities, especially with our youth transitioning out of foster care and our, our veterans. We, we don't want to burden them with an extra bill or, and some of them won't have the ability to get access to um, Excel. So we'll be paying that. Um, I don't know if Brett or one of uh, the other staff people know what the uh, savings will be to us, but we do know that there will be savings. Um, anybody, Brett or? We'll know, excuse me, sorry, we'll know a little bit further as we dive into more of the energy models. We're just not to that point yet. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. And then just a, a quick comment from me. You were talking about all of the services that will be offered uh, to the residents. And uh, I'm sure you guys have probably already thought about this, so my apologies if I'm just uh, repeating what you already know. But uh, there's another great charity here in Arvada called Hope House that offers some 
absolutely wonderful programming, um, particularly uh, garnered for young mothers. So if you have any uh, young families, single moms um, coming into these units, I strongly encourage you to work with them because they focus on some incre incredible uh, community building, breaking the cycle of trauma, things like that, that can be incredible for helping people get on their feet as well. So thank you. We will, we will reach out to them. Ms. Ford. I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. On the current buildings uh, with the 37 residential units, are, do you currently own those buildings or are those privately owned? No, hmm? we own those. You do. And what will happen with those 37 residents? Will they transition into new building? So right now there's 29 residing there and they are all covered under URA, which is HUD's Uniform Relocation Act. They all have protections um, associated with that. They'll all get um, deposit assistance, um, moving assistance, utility assistance, and a stipend um, to pay the, the rent difference. The beautiful thing about this, this development is all of those families will get a housing choice voucher. So they will all have the ability to take their voucher and move to whatever community works best for them and that they will still pay 30% of their income for rent just like they're paying now, but they will, on top of us building 100 new units, we are also getting vouchers for all of those families. We're actually getting 37 vouchers for all of the units that were there. And we will be taking the subsidy contract that's there now and moving it to a different um, property. So we're basically able to triple our units by redeveloping this, this site. Uh, we're really proud of how hard we've worked to make sure that we um, do not lose one bit of subsidy for our families. And so they'll all be well taken care of. So um, your reasoning then for building this is to accommodate more people. I'm assuming, excuse me, that the buildings that you'll be, um, which are brick, by the way, I noticed they were brick buildings, 40 years old. Uh, you'll be taking those down um, just for more accommodation, not because there's anything wrong with those buildings. No, those buildings are not in great condition. Um, we acquired those buildings many years ago. I wasn't here when that happened, but um, being that they are under a HUD subsidy contract, they are required to pass something called REAC, which is a, a very uh, stringent uh, inspection protocol that HUD has in place. And those have not fared very well in on in those under those inspections. Also, have some issues with sewer backup there. So we want to make sure that we're um, redeveloping the site and making sure that it's connected appropriately to all utilities. Um, so no, it's it's not in great condition, and it's not we're not super proud of that property. And we're really working hard to take any property that we feel doesn't meet our um, our quality standards and either redevelop it or rehabilitate it and that pro property is not one that we could do any rehab to we had to just scrape it to make it work so what will your guarantee be in terms of making sure that this particular building will be maintained so that it too will last maybe 40 years hopefully uh what do you think what do you think on the longevity of your buildings well, we, uh, our, our LURAs, our uh, land use agreements are usually 50 years, so we are required to keep it affordable and in good condition for 50 years. Um, all of our new developments are built with that in mind, and um, this will be no different. And will all the units be affordable units, all 100 units be affordable, or will only a certain percentage of them be affordable? All of them will be affordable between 30 and 70% AMI. And then the rest will be at market rate? No, all units. There are no market rate units in the property. All of them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Simpson, I see no other lights. You may make your motion. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the Allison Village conditional use permit located at 5352 Allison Street be approved. This motion is based on the findings of fact adopted by the Planning Commission if approved. Mr. Pfeiffer, your first in comments on yeah. the motion. Thank you very much, Mayor. I just want to say, you know, when we talk about housing diversity, I, it's, I don't know, the long time I've been here, this is the first time I've seen something like this pop up. So I'm glad to see 
some redevelopment happening that not only beautifies our area but addresses a, a long need and desire to have affordable living for uh, our residents. And, and even to further that statement, what I'm impressed about this development is the fact that there's a focus on veterans and our youth. And as many know, sometimes our youth have a hard time uh, having a voice and getting on their feet. And I'm very proud that uh, this is going to be here in our community showing our good hand to help um, those you know up not just a hand out and I'll further that statement with the fact that you're teaming with some of our stakeholders and partners within our city like Red Rocks Community College uh, and even uh, continuing that hand up for folks within your community and our community I also want to say that the creativity of meeting many criteria uh, you know I get it that the parking seems a little bit different but knowing your mission and knowing the vision for this place and knowing how close you are to the uh, transit facility and employment, it fits. It is perfect from that perspective. What I also enjoy is the fact that the parking is covered and just giving, you know, uh, maximizing the space as well as respecting your neighbors. I also like the fact that you're very creative in creating an outdoor environment that also addresses the fire access, extremely creative and multi-use. I also like about this property is not only these residents have an, a dignified uh, living, but they have things to do. There's parks, there's benches, there's a sense of community, there's a basketball court, there's so much more that has been added to this, this place that I think truly reflects what Arvada is about when we talk about a sense of community and how special our community is. And we've now just furthered our uh, our um, culture and way of life to uh, more of our community members that may not uh, be of wealth or or or, in, or having uh, struggles in their lives. So I can keep going on. I applaud that this is in front of us. I have absolutely no questions about this whatsoever. This is a great redevelopment. This is a great property, uh, and I applaud all those that are involved. And obviously, I'll be supporting uh, this and. Uh, welcome you to the neighborhood as soon as you get everything else approved. Mr. Marriott. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to make a couple of comments before I vote. So uh, since what we're doing tonight is approving a conditional use permit, we're, we're approving uh, this use within this zone district, and, and I'm okay with that. I think uh, this is appropriate for this area and this part of Allison Street. I do want to, though, express... Um, a little bit of I, I I hope we're careful with this um, you know because the rest of this approval is administrative that uh, we really do um, administratively look in depth at this the way we as a council previously would have uh, would have looked at it I think the thing to keep in mind here is is that this building is going to be here for a very long time 50 years at least and could be a hundred years um, and and things can and do change um, including the housing authority can and does sell buildings, sell property, and at, at times, you know, once the subsidies wear off, uh, these can even pass into uh, private uh, ownership and operation and, and be operated as any building would. So I just want to make sure that we uh, we're careful with how we uh, how we do that and don't just automatically assume that that you know where the limits are that we just always go to the limits. I think. The staff has a very good roadmap there of, of how and why they might make some uh, some variances, and I hope um, that that they will follow that, and I have full confidence that they will. But you know, this being the first one of these that we've done, I think it it really sets the model for how we go forward. But overall, the comments I would have here is I believe this is a really high quality, very good done development. Uh, very good building you know I think it's got some things that are uh, really terrific about it I think the covered parking is very good uh, I think the the lengths that they've gone to to try to respect the new townhomes to the north um, to try not to to just loom over and dominate those and, and create some space there has been really well done um, and I think this really this thing fits in with 
this part of Allison Street and all up and down Allison Street and uh, is a very nice improvement. So I, I, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I want to congratulate the Housing Authority for um, working very hard to address absolutely everything they can and make the best of uh, this project for um, the Housing Authority, for their clients, but also for the area and for the neighborhood. So uh, for those reasons, I will be voting yes. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to say great job on the concept of this um, development. I love that you know, you're putting resources and um, services on site, and I think that those resources will be instrumental in the future success of the tenants living in your building. Nice job. Congratulations. Love it. Ms. Simpson. Uh, thank you. I just want to echo the comments of all of my uh, colleagues. This is a phenomenal development. It was done with great intention and purpose and thought uh, really to serve so many members of our community that uh, perhaps are often uh, left behind just by circumstances outside their own control. And, you know, we have a really incredible, dynamic, beautiful community here in Arvada, and we really love it. And it's my firm belief I, I campaigned um, on this, and I know my colleagues share my sentiments that we want this community to be home to anyone who wants to call it home and be a part of it and contribute to it. And a development like this certainly enables a lot of people to be part of that dream. So thank you so much to the city team and to the developers and Jefferson County and everybody who put a lot of work into this uh, development, and I am eagerly and enthusiastically supporting it. Ms. Ford? So I uh, just wanted to uh, say that I, when I first read about the development and the parking, I do struggle on the parking, uh, probably will always struggle on the parking, but I really do like the fact that this is an affordable unit. Uh, it is precisely what the city has talked about in terms of transit-oriented development. Um, and again, it's a, it's a need that we have in our community for affordable housing, and I think it's, it's a, a good plan. And I also like the uh, sustainable components in, in terms of the building itself. And um, because of its location, even, you know, not, not just because of its location, that's part of it, but also because of the fact that it will house people who are less fortunate than others, I, I really hope that it will continue once built to be maintained beautifully and kept up well so that the people living there will, will truly have dignity uh, where they're living because we know that there are other places where they don't always have that dignity. So thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll round it up here. You know, I'm, I'm coming at this from a perspective that this is indeed uh, our real test case under our new land development code and our and our procedures that we have recently adopted, uh, and so I'm really going to count on our team here at the city to to prove to us, as I know they will, uh, that they can use their administrative approval process, uh, keeping in mind what they know the city council and other city councils would like to see addressed. I will certainly ask that our team consider the lengthy uh, nine item uh, list that the HOA board of 5360 townhomes put together. Those are not issues that uh, I think are properly before us for the conditional use permit because we're looking at the, uh, should this be residential or not? And it's already residential. So I think that from that perspective, um, you know, this is an appropriate use and that the conditional use permit should be uh, granted, but there are issues that are raised by the um, townhome HOA adjacent to this that I would urge our team to seriously consider uh, and work with the both the applicant and the surrounding neighbors to address some of those concerns in the best possible way. And I can tell you one of the ones that immediately came to mind for me as I looked at this was the color of the building. And it's kind of funny because um, we've got two different color renderings tonight. One's yellow and one's green. I vote green, but we don't get a vote on that. But uh, with that, uh, Ms. Ford, if you will cast your vote. That motion for the conditional use permit passes six to zero. Mr. Jones being an excused absence. 
I'll add my congratulations to uh, the city team for working through this, for the applicant, for their hard work, um, and everyone wishes for great success. Uh, good luck with uh, the CHAFA process, and, and we look forward to seeing this project move forward. Thank you. That concludes our public hearing for tonight. Is there any member of the public that wishes to address us at this time? I see we have no one in the audience. Ms. Rush indicates that we have no one um, signed in to speak by phone or Zoom. So I will close the public comment portion, open it up for City Council reports. Seeing none, I'll give one, actually three. First of all, Mr. Devin, can you um, enlighten us, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, uh, I just want facts as to what uh, the process is and what the expenses that the city of Arvada has with the various scenarios of the current recall effort. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, as I believe uh, you are all well aware, the number of signatures required to initiate a municipal recall election for a member or members of the city council is 25% of the total votes cast for a respective office uh, in the previous uh, election. Uh, the petitioners have 60 days to gather uh, enough signatures, uh, which um, is, a, is a comparatively short window. Uh, the reason why I mention that is that um, in late June, uh, the city clerk approved the circulation of the petitions. Uh, the city clerk's authorization did not constitute an approval of the form or contents of the petition, but rather commenced the running of the time periods provided in the city code and our charter. The recall petition uh, shall be filed with the requisite information and signatures um, uh, should be provided to the city clerk uh, between the dates of August the 24th through the 28th. The reason for the range is because uh, for the um, four council offices uh, from which the petition are, are circulating, uh, they were all taken out on different dates. So that's why there's a date range of between August 24th and 28th. Uh, if the recall petition is filed between that time frame of August the 24th through the 28th, then the city clerk must complete her review uh, within 20 days or by approximately September 17th. Now, if petitions are submitted for all four council members, then we, the city clerk would be having to review and verify up to 19,192 signatures. Um, so that would uh, take some time, obviously. Um, and in order for us to be able to meet uh, the election, uh, the coordinated, uh, the November 3rd coordinated election, uh, the city clerk would need to uh, complete that process uh, by September 4th, uh, which would be approximately seven days for the city clerk to do that. Uh, that is pretty much, I would say, an impossible task. To complete, uh, city clerk would need to take uh, the the uh, amount of time that is allowed uh, under under uh, law, uh, which would be the 20 days that would take it to September the 17th. If um, in that case, uh, then. Um, uh, in addition to the fact that it would uh, go uh, up to uh, September 17th, uh, there would also be uh, the opportunity uh, for uh, within 20 days of the filing of the petition uh, uh, for uh, uh, someone to file a protest of, uh, to uh, uh, protest the validity of the, of the uh, uh, petitions, uh, of each petition, which would uh, also require um, uh, some additional time uh, for that to, to be decided. Uh, so that could be as late as, I believe, September the 21st. Uh, therefore, it's, it's very unlikely that this recall uh, would be able to be placed on the November 3rd coordinated election. Um, if it was to be placed on the November 3rd uh, coordinated election, it would cost us an estimated additional $40,000. Uh, but in the event that it's not uh, placed on the November 3rd coordinated election, then we would need to hold a special election, and this is uh, in the time frames established by our charter, uh, uh, sometime after the November 3rd coordinated election, which we estimate, uh, based on all the information we have now, uh, to be somewhere in the vicinity of the uh, third or fourth week of November. So within about three weeks of the coordinated election, then we could conceivably hold a second election. Uh, 
that cost, based on the estimates that have been uh, provided by other cities uh, that have gone through similar processes, uh, could cost us up to $200,000. Um, and, and then in the event uh, that three or uh, more uh, council members uh, are recalled, then, then we would have to establish a second uh, election uh, in order to uh, fill those offices for the three or more council members that are recalled at an additional cost of $200,000. Uh, so when people ask us what the potential cost of this uh, process is, we estimate that it could be $400,000. Now, in the event that only two um, um, or fewer council members are recalled, then the city council would have the opportunity to appoint uh, members um, to uh, take the place of the of the recall council members. So in that case, we would only be looking at one election, which is the recall election, at a cost of two hundred thousand dollars. So therefore, the cost of this uh, would range between two hundred thousand and four hundred thousand dollars, depending on the outcome of the petitioning process. I hope that's uh, uh, clear. If it's not, I know I have uh, the city clerk and the city attorney that are available to. Uh, add any uh, information or answer any questions you may have. And the, and the only way that that cost would be at the $40,000 figure would be if if the stars aligned and everything could be completed um, in time to meet a deadline for the November 3rd election. Correct. Very good. Thank you for that. Next, I want to uh, congratulate our police department. They had their first of uh, their scheduled listening tours today. And uh, both uh, Mr. Marriott and I uh, joined that by Zoom. I, I don't know if there were people from the public at the meeting. I think there were. You, you can't tell because <laughs> of the cameras and everything who's live and who's Memorex. But um, um, it certainly was a great opportunity for our uh, chief and, and his command staff to be able to give some explanations and, more importantly, listen to concerns that citizens had um, and be able to address those questions and inquiries. Uh, it was certainly, uh, this was um, Sector D, so the Whisper Creek Station, uh, and they're going to be doing that, and I assume, uh, Ben, that we'll be getting out the information as to those other uh, locations and times. He's nodding his head yes. Um, I urge people to join in on those, either live and in person or uh, joining the, the Zoom link, it's, um, it's exactly what we should be doing right now in terms of listening to our citizens, addressing their issues as it pertains to calls for defunding police or uh, recognition that we have uh, steps that we need to be undertaking to make sure that our systemic um, issues that have uh, come up uh, are clearly being addressed and addressed appropriately. Um, and I think it's, I really applaud our department for doing that. And um, I know that um, the conversations that are happening are truly being taken to heart and, and are very, very meaningful. My last comment tonight is I want to comment and uh, really praise uh, Dot and Ranger Miller for having a very successful Blues and Barbecue event during a pandemic. It, uh, uh, Luann and I were able to go last night and listen to uh, Rangers Band do some Bruce Springsteen. Did a, um, uh, it was great fun, and they have, this is such a great thing that they do every year. For a few years, it was here in Arvada. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been down in Edgewater. Because of the pandemic, they moved to more of a virtual format, but uh, were able to use the venue in, up in uh, unincorporated Adams County. And... It, that was so exciting to see the people who were making donations. It's my understanding that they had their best donations to benefit Habitat for Humanity in their history. They raised uh, over $50,000 this weekend for that. And over the course of the years that uh, Ranger started this, and of course once Dot got in the mix, it, it became even more successful. But during the course of the years that uh, Ranger has done this, now with the assistance of Dot, has raised over $400,000 for Habitat for Humanity. And Habitat for Humanity is such a great program. I've had the, I've had the good fortune to be able to uh, to assist in pounding nails on a on a project, and we've got future projects. We've had a past project here in Arvada. We've got future projects in the pipeline for Arvada for Habitat for Humanity. 
And as I said last night during some comments that this is such a great program because it's, it's a hands up, it's not a handout. Uh, these, these individuals who receive these properties, we, uh, Metro Mayors had an opportunity to, to talk to some of the new prospective homeowners as they were working on their homes and just the pride that they had in what they were doing and how they were helping to give some sweat equity in terms of, of, um, of building their future home and, and how it was really going to be a gateway for them to, to for respect, for, for being able to, to be good beneficial members of our society. So uh, again, Dot and Ranger, congratulations. It was absolutely uh, a great success and we look forward to the success of Blues and Barbecue for years to come. And you can donate online at bluesandbbq.com. So, so please uh, hit that donate button. So that's all I have. Mr. Devin? Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, next uh, Monday uh, we have a workshop. Uh, really excited to present an update on traffic calming and pilot projects uh, that we've initiated, uh, some of which I believe uh, council has been aware of. Um, and also update on our IGA uh, for the Transit Hub with RTD. Um, and then, uh, you know, you mentioned the land development code process. We're checking in actually next Monday on, on some of the process issues associated with the land development code. And I think some of that you covered tonight uh, with, the, with the project that you just approved. So uh, the land development code is going to, I think, be an ongoing discussion to make sure that what our team is doing and how we're dealing with these issues is aligned with the city council's uh, desires and, and, and direction. So uh, that will uh, also be, uh, we'll have a conversation next Monday about that as well. Great. Ms. Morris? Nothing for me, Your Honor. Very good. We stand adjourned. I will put on my blues and barbecue uh, face mask and we'll call it a night. <laughs>